How did you feel when you heard that the boat was no longer coming um, to bring the tourists to Milo nor to the Citadel? When we heard that the boat was no longer coming and we heard that they were staying in Labadi only and they were no longer going to Milo nor Okap, we were very, very saddened. We spent a lot of money. We thought that the tourists were going to make purchases. And even our school supplies that we had to purchase for our kids, um, we spent the, that money to prepare. And then we had to hear that the tourists were no longer coming. That really hurt us. Furthermore, when we heard that um, the reason for them not visiting us was political, and we also heard that they, they were told that hundred people, hundreds of people are dying daily, uh, you know, that was really a lie. And, um, you know, you must know that people were doing demonstrations for the president with pictures of President Aristide in their hands, and nobody heard them. They were walking all over the place with those pictures, demonstrating for the president, President Aristide, you know. And, you know, there's only a little group, only a little group um, who's going around saying that the people are waiting for Aristide to return. That's not true. And, you know, that there's only the, this small little group that, that is uh, wanting Aristide to return. And, you know, that um, the country is divided since 10 years, they've had the country in their hands, and they really did not do much with it. As a matter of fact, they crippled the country. And, you know, um, in every country, you have to be able to have um, the political part remain in its own space and the economic part to stay in its own space. You know, especially the people who are living outside of the country. If they could try to help us to keep the economic side in its um, place and the um, political side in its place. And before I said left, Labadi was closed again because of politics. And now it's been reopened. And now there's only a month left for schools to reopen. You know, I have um, I have some kids in the university, and it seems like this year they're not going to go to school. And I wanted to ask you to please help us. Tell them to keep the politics with the politics and allow the economic um, situation of the country to flourish. And uh, furthermore, when you're coming next time, I would like for you to dock at the port of Cap Haitian like it used to be. Because um, I remember in the old days, every um, Thursday, every Tuesday, they used to, uh, we used to have ships docking over there. And ever since they stopped. Um, allowing tourists to come to Cap Haitien, we are in a totally deplorable state. And I must say that it is La Valas that really destroyed the country. And while Aristide left, um, finally we could take a breather um, with the, from those chimeras who have been burning tires, um, shooting all over the place, um, clanging their, their machetes in people's doors. And since he's left, we have not heard really from the Shimea. And you know, it that means that it has been them causing problems. And they're the ones also lying to keep tourists from con coming to this country. I'm just waiting now for your answer to see how you're going to help us. What is the name of your committee and what does that committee do? My committee's name is M-A-C-C. -C. It's the Committee of Community Action. In this community, there are many kids who do not go to school. And what we've done is we've leased a house to build a school so we can um, allow the kids to go to school. And you know when those kids don't go to school, 
you know they pay the money to go out there and burn tires and cause civil disruptions um, they give them twenty dollars to go in and do that and we understand that if they were educated they would not do these type of things and because you know at least if they were educated they would know that um, burning tires is not good for their health We're also working to see if we can build a, a health clinic in this area. And you know, the hospital is not very efficient because you, if you go the very first day to get um, an exam, you will get your result in four days. And so we're asking all the international organizations that are helping people we're asking them to help our committee to see how we can uh, build even a hospital or a health center. Where is Konasa? Konasa is in on the road of uh, the airport. We're in front. We're located in front of Soji Bank. That's the zone where you are located. Yes, we are. Is it a community group or a political group? No, we're not a political group. We are a community group. You're not connected to any political party. No, we're not. We are a community group. We're not associated to any political parties. We're trying to advance the community and the economic situation of the community, so we're not involved in politics. Are you in the committee also? That's another committee. Oh, so this is the organization for the development of Petit Dance. How about you? How do you feel and also how do you think the people feel um, in this area? Um, first of all, um, what type of preparation did you make for this cruise that was supposed to come in Haiti? Many preparations were made. First of all, we were responsible for the welcoming. We were cleaning, we were motivating the people. We were preparing a welcoming committee. So we were working together with the Konasa committee because we want to develop a, a relationship of collaboration with all the different committees. Because if we're talking about development, we don't see ourselves first, but we see the whole area. Petitans is after the airport. So you're close to Konasa? Yes, we're close. Our organization is responsible for cleaning and in September, we are going to open a school. We've worked hard to facilitate the opening of a school that's going to um, house 300 children. Every Monday, we clean the streets, we, we remove um, all the garbage and of course the mayor of Cap Haitien helps us to find garbage bags to put the garbage in and he um, causes um, the, the car, the garbage um, trucks to come and pick them up. And you know in Petitans we don't have a telephone um, system, we don't have any, any ways of communication. And you know we're saying that we are struggling for development to happen. So how do you feel and how do the people in the area feel when you learned that cruising into history wasn't going to Milo no Citadel? You know, this was very hard for us. Why? First of all, not only because of the investments that they made,
well you know it was really this news meant that there was no um, hope for Haiti because imagine the um, you know tourists not being allowed to come here um, that was very difficult for us and um, that took the opportunity for our commerce to develop that took away the opportunity for the little merchants to um, make some money and of course even those people who were ready to offer something special to the tourists they were very shocked they were very hurt even though we are here with the tourists but um, we were very sad that we were not able to go to Milo with them. And uh, it's unfortunate that they were trying to scare them and to keep them away. But um, when you get to the 10th apartment, please let them know that it was all a lie. I was very shocked because I really felt that um, Haiti missed a very big chance um, for development. So just like CONASA, or your group is this, is an organization for the development of petitans. Is your group a social group? Is it a political group? Are you connected to any political parties? No, we don't have any political affiliation. Our politics is a politics of development. We have a, a social, we do social politics, uh, moral and intellectual politics. We're trying to do our very best so that La Petitance be sovereign. But our organization is sovereign because we're not affiliated to any political parties. My name is Avna Jasmine. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really sorry about what happened. I hope we can return and so we can meet up with our brothers and sisters. It wasn't our intention to come and stay here in Labadie. The circumstances um, caused that the um, organizers had to make this choice, but it wasn't our intention. We appreciate um, your words and uh, all we're asking you to do is when you get um, to the states, you know, let them know that those politicians cause are doing more harm than good to the country. They're crying. They're not crying where the dead body, where the corpse is. They're crying where the coffin is. We want Haiti to remain the pearl of the Caribbean and not a pearl of, of garbage. You know, and, and I'm, I'm calling everyone who doesn't do what they're supposed to do um, illiterate. If you were supposed to say something, you didn't say it, you're illiterate. Do something and you didn't do it, you're an illiterate. Okay, you're not taking this dude. Okay, enough. today that you are going to travel with us in August of next year for an experience of a lifetime. I think this is one of the most monumental happenings in, you know, in our time. This is not just about a sentimental journey to Haiti. It's about reclaiming our own history. There's never been a cruise like this. I'm here today to invite you to join us in a very, very exciting program. August 14th through the 21st in 2004, we are going to be embarking on a project that will absolutely be thrilling. We're going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, which produced the first black republic in this hemisphere. And our cruise, Cruising into History, is going to share in that celebration. And we want you to be a part of it. We are embarking on a pilgrimage which will involve us actually going on a cruise ship for seven days and we are going to go to various islands and end up in Haiti. 
We have been able to enter an agreement with Royal Caribbean Cruise Line to take one of the most magnificent ships afloat, the Navigator of the Seas, and we'll have 1,750 uh, berths on that ship. Royal Caribbean Cruise Line is the only one that currently makes a stop in Haiti, in the northern part of the country near Cape Haitian in a wonderful, wonderful uh, peninsula called Labadee. And so Labadee, Haiti will be our one destination uh, in Haiti, though we will go from that destination to other parts uh, of the island. And we're gonna leave from Miami and we're gonna go through in a kind of a Pan-African victory lap throughout the Caribbean. We're gonna go to Nassau and the Bahamas. And then we're gonna go to St. Thomas, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And then we will go to Haiti. But along the route, we're gonna have an international black arts and cultural festival that you will not believe. Danny Glover, who is our ambassador at large for this project, and we all know Danny Glover, what a wonderful human being he, he is. He's adopted this, this project. He's spoken, he's been all across the country speaking about it. So Danny's gonna be with us on the cruise, and Harry Belafonte, he's gonna help organize a tribute from the Caribbean. Hugh Masekela is coming, it's already confirmed actually, we're gonna be bringing Hugh Masekela in to do a tribute from Africa. From the Haitian community, uh, we have Tabo Combo that's uh, committed to being a part of this program. Bukman Experience will be there. Strings and our own uh, band here from where I come from in New York City, the Jarara, which is one of the Haitian roots bands. The Progressive Baptist Convention is going to have a ecumenical interfaith religious service because a lot of people have asked us about that. In fact, on the Sunday while we're on the ship, we're gonna have a religious service and it's gonna be a religious service. Susan Taylor and Bev Smith, what a combination that's gonna be. They're gonna to put together a, a sister to sister chat, a women's issues forum to talk about those issues that affect black families and black womanhood and relationship to black men and where do we go from here? Everybody from uh, Congressman John Conyers, the Dean of the Congressional Black Caucus, Maxine Waters, Ed Weege, Dandicott, the Reverend Jesse Lewis Jackson, Al Sharpton, I mean, you name it, and they're going to be a part of the State of the Black World Forum. We're going to have a health symposium while we're on the ship uh, to deal with issues of African American health. We're going to have a Pan African Film Fe Festival, and you'll have an opportunity to do several things. Some will be able to go to the Citadel to see one of the great monuments. This, was a, this is a magnificent mountaintop fortress that was built by King Henri Christophe to deter the French and others from coming back. And then we'll have an opportunity to visit the area of Cape Haitian, which is the second largest city in Haiti. It's an oceanside city. And to, to, there'll be a pavilion there for food and arts and craft. Uh, and then you'll have an opportunity, some will go to Port-au-Prince, the capital city. This is the largest city in Haiti and there'll be a, a, an exhibit on the transatlantic slave trade. There's an exhibit that will be there also uh, on Africa while we're there, uh, the Museum of the Heroes, and also the Presidential Palace, uh, which is a really magnificent structure. Others will go to the lovely seaside town of Jacmel, and they will be treated to a special um, a reenactment of Carnival. If you bring your children, uh, we're working on crafting a children's program but also the Royal Caribbean Cruise Line that does this all the time has provided for a kids program so that when you want your kids with you, that's fine. When you kind of want a little space to yourself, you know, so you can chill, your husband and wife and partners or whatever, or just to, you know, just to relax a little bit, that'll be taken care of. So you don't have to worry about it. You can bring your uh, children right along with you. But there's only a limited number of spaces on the ship for third and fourth persons. The third and fourth persons are less expensive. There's a substantial price break, but if you want a third and fourth person cabin, either third or a quad, trip or a quad, you really need to register right now because those will be going very, very, very fast. Really want to thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share my vision with you. The dates, once again, are August 14th through the 21st in 2004, but the time to get on board is right now. Call us at 800-871-7341. Once again, 800-871-7341. And our website is www.cruisingintohistory.org. See you on board.
Papa, Papa, les bas campés dans la barrière. Eh, ah. Parrain, les bas campés dans la barrière. Eh, ah. I was born in Marchand de Salines, Haiti. I grew up in Delma. Uh, Delma, at the time, was a vast, huge land with lots of trees, um, soccer fields abounded. As a young boy growing up in Haiti, in a fairly middle-class family, there really there, there are, I felt no responsibility in terms of the household per se. My responsibility was go to school and pass my classes. Beyond that, I didn't feel as if I had anything to do. I had to do anything in the house. Who, who did those things? Um, the big people, <laughs> the girls <laughs> did those things, young boys. You go to school and you play football. Well, I went to the U.S. to visit my parents. And I think their plan was, you'll come for vacation and then you'll go back. That's what, that was, well, at least that's what they told me the plan was. When I got there, my father still wanted us to come back, but my mother insisted, no, they're not going anywhere, they're staying with us. And so we went, and then come school time, we stayed. Uh, we lived in Flatbush, Haitian Central. <laughs> Might as well be called Little Haiti. <laughs> as a Haitian kid attending high school, you had a lot to contend with. First of all, foreign language. It's a third language, not even a second language. English is a third language. And uh, you know, kids tease you about that. But most importantly, you had the boat people stuff happening in the 80s. Lots of boat people going to Miami, and it was in the news. Haitian, boat people, so there was teasing about that. The worst part was the AIDS thing in 1983. Uh, I remember watching it on television with my parents and brothers and sisters, and of course my parents were outraged as the way, uh, about, about the way it was portrayed on, uh, I think, 2020 at the time. But the only thing that the three of us kept thinking about, me, my brother, and my sister, was how are we going to face the kids when we go to school? After high school, I went to the university in Long Island, State University of New York at Stony Brook. I enrolled there um, to study engineering. Okay. <laughs> like your father. Exactly. <laughs> and then what happened? Um, and then I, well, I went in, I started to take classes in math and science and all the stuff that would have led me to a bright future as an engineer. But then I took a class in economics and I fell in love. I, I, I discovered that I was an economist and not an engineer. The worst thing is, was not even that discovery, it was telling my father that I wanted to study economics and not engineer. <laughs> And by the time, by my sophomore year in college, I was exposed to a lot of things happening in the world in terms of liberation struggles uh, in Central, well, in Central America with the Contras, the Sandinistas, El Salvador, and of course what was, my eyes opened up big time to what was happening in Haiti. And the only, my, my education I saw, I analyzed it only um, in function of what I can use it to do regarding Haiti and to a bigger extent what I can do with the world. I was very, uh, uh, I should watch what's the word I'm looking for, I was very idealistic, totally idealistic and just my worth as an individual was only in function of what can I use my education? How can I use my education to make the world better? I went to the Quixote Center in 1992. That's, that's actually while I was still at Howard. 
um, I, in 1992, there was a coup d'etat in Haiti. And I, dis I went to the Quixote Center because it, they had a program on Haiti and they were challenging not just the coup d'etat that had taken place against a popular government, but they were challenging the policies of the U.S. with regards to Haiti. I came here during the coup uh, to do research, to look at the political situation and the human rights issues. It was scary as hell. First of all, with my last name, <laughs> Coming into the airport, I, I I always felt like, well, if the coup leaders, if the soldiers didn't kill me, I was going to have a heart attack <laughs> at the airport because my heart was beating faster than an assault or drum. It was amazing. And I always had money um, in my passport just ready for a bribe at any moment that they say, oh, the last time is I still just... Okay, just keep quiet. <laughs> so was there any relationship between you and the president? No, no, I'm not aware of any relationship between us. In fact, we, we talked about that the first time we met and we, we went back and we couldn't determine any relationship. So we, 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 we figured out maybe there wasn't. Um, so... So besides, I'm much better looking than he is. So <laughs> uh, then after that, uh, I went to work for the Washington office on Haiti. I was, I was chosen as the executive director and the Washington office on Haiti, at the time it was uh, the, most, the most prominent political, analytical think tank on Haiti. It worked singularly on Haiti and it, what we, we were consulted by almost everyone for analysis, for research, um, ideas, advice on things that had to do with Haiti. And so the highlight of my stay at the Washington office on Haiti is this campaign that I started called the Haiti Economic Justice Campaign. The tangible impact, the first thing we wanted was, what we didn't want to do was to articulate a plan for the Haitian people. We didn't want to do that. So we certainly didn't want the World Bank and the IMF to do it. We called it economic justice campaign because we wanted, we wanted the development plan to come from Haiti. So what we did mostly was to create this platform, create this space so that the Haitian people can express their own views about economic policies. We were hoping, the tangible thing that we were hoping is that those things which are never present in policy debates on Haiti would have their rightful place right up there with the big guns and the big shots at the IMF and the World Bank. It's a subject that had been totally esoteric before. When you talk economics, nobody understood what it was. Today you go around in Haiti, or mostly anywhere, and you talk um, neoliberal economic policies, by and large, people have a sense of what you're talking about. And we believe that we played a role, at least in the context of Haiti, to, to democratize that debate, to make more people understand it, and with, which therefore means more people have a handle to challenge uh, those policies that they deem incorrect. <laughs> This is the organization that I work for. It's the Fondation Semans Haiti, or Seed Haiti Foundation. It's a loan fund, and I am the fund manager. So what does the fund manager do? The fund manager manages the portfolio of the loan fund, and I provide technical assistance to the cooperatives that we work with. Um, and we, I also try to secure technical assistance for them in other areas that I can do myself. September of the year 2000, the place, Washington. It was after, after during the time I was working at Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, that was in 1999. You know, it was boring as hell. I was a researcher doing real boring stuff. I mean, the pay was good, but I was miserable. 
And I decided, and I, of course, I was eternally connected to matters happening in Haiti. You know, I would, during the day, work for PricewaterhouseCoopers, but immediately afterwards, I was involved in so many things that had to do with Haiti, except, you know, I was not getting paid for it, which is okay. But it's, it, it, I, I thought, well, it would be great to combine the two, to combine my profession with something that I really, to combine my job with something that I really, really like. And I was convinced that it was Haiti. So, as a diaspora, do you feel like now there's potential for you to have more of a community? Don't call me a diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't strongly about that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Do you think you're perceived as a diaspora? Of course I am. And what does that what does that bring with it? What kind of uh, image does that have? Yeah, well, it has changed. Um, there was a time when there was a very strong resentment uh, towards the diaspora, where diaspora was seen as people who wouldn't have the balls to stay when things were rough. And you know, I return here. If if if, and and I still get that people are talking about things in Haiti, and if I say things that disagree with them, they're like, ah, what do you know? You don't, you you didn't even live here for all those years. You don't know what it was like. For example, on on debates about the embargo or the coup d'état, they would say, well, you know, we lived here during the coup. We knew what it was like. You don't. You know, just things like that about. You can't know any better because you're a diaspora. So how does that make you feel? Uh, that, that doesn't bother me at all. I, well, I, actually, I can say that it does bother me. <laughs> because, see, but it used to bother me more than it does now. It used to bother me because, you remember I told you before, I always saw myself as 100% Haitian without any hyphenated stuff, without any Haitian-American, because I thought it was a contradiction to be Haitian and American at the same time. <laughs> but you know, it takes coming back to Haiti to realize that in spite of, in spite of whatever I may think about um, not wanting any American influence, the reality is that I grew up at least for, well, for the most important part of my life, I spent it in the U.S., my high school years, my formative, well, not my formative years, but my, the years in my life when I was really soaking a lot of uh, consciousness, the years in my life when I read the most, the years in my life when I became aware of so many things, those things definitely influenced me. And some of my reactions, a lot of my reactions are different from a Haitian who grew up lived and studied here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm Haitian, but I'm a Haitian who studied in the U.S., who, who worked in the U.S., and that means something that is different from if I had lived there all of my life. So how long do you plan to stay? I'm living in December. And you smile. <laughs> Why are you looking forward to that? I am, because it's... I value totally the work that I've done here. I think it has had um, very tangible um, impacts on projects, on people's lives, things that I really can see. Um, I've learned a lot and I think I've given a lot to the organization. But you know, I think that it's kind of ironic. It took coming back to Haiti for me to realize that there are I can be much more useful to Haiti, outside of Haiti. Does it disappoint you knowing that? No, no. To me, it's actually a big relief. It's like I had this. I was, I was, I was consciously fighting the etiquette, the label, Haitian American. So, just to realize that that's that's what I am is a relief. And I think having realized that, it means that I can be. I'm, I'm freer to express myself as that person from the standpoint of that person and therefore be more, be more useful. So it took coming here to find Yes, absolutely. Out. There's no way I would have found that out if I had stayed there.
Minister Voltaire. Yeah, yeah, last night. Yeah. We need Minister Voltaire. Yeah, we need him. We need him to support him. Mm. I want to uh, welcome you all here. It's a press conference to you know, hear releases that's uh, been organized by the Haiti Support Project in conjunction with the Cruising into History uh, cruise that will be happening in the year 2004. And I'll just introduce, I guess, from the far right, Danny Glover, actor, activist, humanitarian. Dr. Ron Daniels, Dr. Ron Daniels, the founder and chairperson of the Haiti Support Project, and the Constitutional Rights, the Honorable Leslie Voltaire, who is the Minister for Haitians Living Abroad, who's come from Haiti, and Congressman John Conyers, the leading advocate in the U.S. Congress for Aid to Haiti, also the ranking Democrat on the House Judiciary Committee and the second most senior member of the House of Representatives. Well, good morning, all. We uh, apologize for being somewhat late, but uh, as things go, flights and these different things. So we are very excited to be here on this uh, occasion. Uh, we're gathered here today for a very auspicious occasion, the formal kickoff event for Cruising in the History. This is an effort to mobilize more than 3,000 people to journey to Haiti via cruise ship, hopefully this cruise ship, to participate in the commemoration of the 200th anniversary of one of the greatest events in human history, the consummation of the Haitian Revolution, which produced the first black republic in this hemisphere. We are delighted to be joined on this occasion by uh, several very special guests. Danny Gubber has already been uh, introduced. We also have with us uh, Bev Smith, who's sitting out there somewhere, the first lady of nighttime talk radio. Uh, Congressman Conyers is here. Uh, Jacques Moriel is here representing uh, Ernest Moriel, the former mayor of New Orleans and also the National Council of Mayors. Uh, council uh, Guy Victor, the Council General for here in Miami, is somewhere about. He's there. And uh, we also have the uh, Council General Jean Christian Marc, who, if he's not here, is in the room, is here. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the Honorable Leslie Voltaire, Minister for Haitian Living Abroad, and his wife, uh, uh, Marie Carol Roy Voltaire, who's representing the Ministry of Culture. Um, we are also uh, just delighted that they're all here for this extraordinary launch. Uh, this exciting pilgrimage is tentatively scheduled for. August 14th through the 21st, 2004. It will include an international black arts and cultural festival by land, by sea and land. But this initiative is much more than just a vacation to Haiti. Beyond the exciting and memorable cool cruise, the goals of the initiative are to highlight the heroic and co heroic contributions of the Haitian people to the glo global struggle of black freedom to draw attention to the long-standing struggle of the Haitian people for democracy and development, to encourage socially responsible investment in Haiti, including the growth of cultural historical tourism, to foster relationships between people of African descent and Haitians and friends of Haiti, to build a vital solidarity network in support of the contemporary struggle for the democracy and development in Haiti. In sharing in the celebration of the, the 200th anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, it is our intent that this pilgrimage serve as a catalyst to mobilize people of African descent and friends of Haiti to substantially and substantively assist the heroic Haitian people to achieve the long delayed goal of building a strong, vital and a strong and vital democracy and vibrant economy. Hence, this day marks the beginning of our efforts to implement a big project with a grand vision. But with the assistance of the many friends and supporters who have gathered here today, we are confident that cruising into history will be a major success. Now I'd like to turn to my friend, Leslie Voltaire, for any comments that you'd like to offer on this occasion. Thank you. <clears throat> we think this is history in the making. Uh, it is a once in a life opportunity for Haiti to break the silence around the revolution, the revolution which is much more fundamental than the French or the American Revolution because this was a revolution made by the slaves while the other revolutions, the French and the Americans, were made by owners of slaves. And this is an opportunity 
to build a modern state in Haiti, a state that will break with the apartheid, with um, yes. the high illiteracy rate in Haiti, the weakened uh, institutions, and the deterioration of the environment. This is an opportunity for us to spotlight Haiti as a step stone to build that modern state, and it's a kickoff for Haiti to grow and uh, shine again in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to defer to uh, the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee and the Dean of the Congressional Black Caucus, and as he was introduced, the leading advocate in the Congress of the United States for Haiti, the Honorable John Conyers, Jr., Democrat of Michigan. Thank you very much. Brothers and sisters, uh, we first must applaud the uh, genius of Ron Daniels for bringing us here today. Should we do that now? Uh, the second thing we have to consider is that we are moving into history to reacquaint ourselves with the importance of our contribution and also to make history as we put our arms around these eight million beloved citizens of this great nation and begin first a celebration but a global reorganization of the support that Haiti needs to make it a thriving, successful, economic democracy. No. This, it, I've already discussed this uh, with, with my, uh, my client, I'm an agent uh, other time, my client Danny Glover, I've talked with this about, and uh, uh, this, this ship, may be too small for the number of people that we plan to bring in. I mean, you do the math. Uh, 30 million of us, uh, this wonderful vessel, uh, if we only get a fraction of those that are committed to Haiti, uh, we would need more than one ship. Uh, I've been calculating here that the extended Conyers clan alone would take up one ship. <laughs> so I don't know what this one ship business is about. Uh, we need to recognize that this 200th anniversary is a rededication to a global issue that we have been working with uh, for so long, it, it has been wisely said that everything is everything. And not to understand Haiti's past and future connection with the struggle for the freedom of all people alone is worth our coming together uh, for this great undertaking. Thank you very much. And now, uh, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Condes. And now to the uh, agent, or, or the client, I'm sorry. Uh, Danny Glover has been described by Harry Belafonte as the person in his mind who comes closest to Paul Robeson, which is an extraordinary compliment, and one I think is well-deserved, because uh, he, this man constantly uses his celebrity, because really he is not first and foremost a celebrity. He is first and foremost a humanitarian, first and foremost a human rights and civil rights advocate. So even though he's an actor and we love him, he got mobbed at the airport, I want to introduce the civil rights, human rights activist and the man who's done so much for all of us in representing us around the world, Danny Glover. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I first want to thank the Council General for being here, as well as the Sir Leslie Voltaire, my, my friend and colleague, uh, fellow Thesbian. John Conyers and Ron Daniels, of course. When I, as a young student, when I read 
C.L.R. James Black Jacobin. <laughs> it certainly transformed me in such an incredible way. The 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 events, the book itself, and that this analysis of the Haitian Revolution was required reading for me 30 some odd years ago as a young student. And to, to put this within some sort of context, what is happening, because this event, this cruising into history, is, as John said, it's about reclaiming our own history. It's about giving voice to the context, the real context in which Haiti exists. We, the context we're always familiar with is the one that of, of struggling a poor country, the poorest country in the hemisphere, which is reality, and that our other context is that these, these poor Haitian boat people who seem to end up on our, our shores. But there's another way in which we have to see this his, heroic struggle, which, which as, as Leslie said, was the most important of the three revolutions that happened within 25 years, because it took the rights of man, the French Revolution, it took the Declaration of Independence and it elevated it to the highest place it could be elevated to. And that's what this was. And for that, the Haitian people have been condemned in history for that. They endured a 60-year embargo by the United States and they continued <coughs> to, be, to be thrown aside because of this heroic, this heroic manifestation of creating this nation. We have to celebrate this and embrace this. We envision bringing academians to it. We envision bringing, bringing artists to it. We envision bringing uh, uh, organizations, social organizations. We envision bringing civic organizations. We envision bringing everyone to this, this event. And the event is not only, it's going to, part of it is going to be celebrated in Haiti, yes, but it has to be celebrated here. It is, must be celebrated here. It must be acknowledged to us, to all of us, as human beings first. It is it's the most important thing to happen in the history, in modern history. It is the most important thing to happen in modern history because it takes, it redefines the whole landscape. So we, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm sure that, that we, we're not gonna have all the time we do, but, but as the ambassador at large, which I've, I've just been appointed as ambassador at large, I'm gonna be out there pounding the pavement and doing whatever it is. And it's also, for me, for me there's something else as well. I've been for the last 20 years trying to develop a script on Toussaint Louverture. Yeah. And I finally have a script which we're in the process of trying to put together and, 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 uh, and make. Uh, it may not get to 2004. Uh, uh, and, and we may not have it made by the end of 2004, which is, you know, with films, to go in in perpetuity. So this film, once it's done, it'll be for there for our children. But imagine the opportunity we have here, and I think we have to look at it as an opportunity, the opportunity to have websites, to have teach-ins, to really create, to bring all levels of, 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 of uh, all people together on this very historic and monumental event. How many people get to say that they were involved in the 200, uh, 200 anniversary uh, celebration of a nation's history? None of us were here at the, at which, at the period that watched the 100th, 100th anniversary, and none of us will be here unless, unless something else happens when it was marked at 300. But we, we're here to do this. We hit this opportunity, and we have this opportunity. It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Thank you very much, Danny. Uh, Ambassador Glover. And we will all take a few minutes from press people only, because we're running behind. We have to join in the program, but we, are, we obviously want to entertain any questions from the representatives of press who have questions. Yes. Uh, how will you all decide in terms of who will get to go on the cruise, and what will be the cost? But we don't have a precise figure on the on the exact figure on the cost. What we are doing, well, first of all, the cruise is open to anybody and everybody who wants to go. So there's no, I mean, there's no profiling on this one. 
you know, the profile is ambition, eagerness, and willingness to step to the plate. I mean, typically um, a cruise, um, and I've done several of them, and several, uh, several of them are Royal Caribbean Line. Uh, if you're in Miami, it might go anywhere from about $1,200 to, depending on the cabin that you want. So it could go as high as your taste. So if you want to really live uh, ex exorbitantly, you can do five or $6,000. But it's in the $1,000, $2,000, $2,500 range, and we will have an installment plan so that people will be able to pay over a period of about 18 months. The other thing that we'll be doing today is making an appeal, and we already have some in hand, for what we call the Tucson Loverture VIP Circuit. The first 500 people who are willing to commit to this proposition, which really means 1,000 people because it's a couple, it's based on double occupancy, uh, and these people will get special privileges, discounts on the tours, but more importantly, the distinction and honor of having launched uh, this initiative. So we're opening a a trust account, an escrow account at the SunTrust Bank here in Miami, uh, and we'll be depositing, um, hopefully by the end of the next week, next week, a few thousand dollars to begin that account. How did the idea or concept of a cruise? Why, why a cruise? Well, I must confess that it was uh, my idea. <laughs> um, with the Haiti Support Project, the Haiti Support Project, which I founded in 1995 after my very first trip to Haiti and having fallen in love with the Haitian people, because there was so much Africa, so much vibrancy, so much pain, but so much courage and creativity there. We have contributed through various ways about a half a million dollars in material support uh, to Haiti. So one of the ideas I had, since I like cruising myself, was to take people to Haiti as a fundraiser to go to the Citadel. Uh, and we have done that on the Royal Caribbean Line. They're the only cruise line that actually goes to Haiti. And so it occurred to me, uh, because we were talking earlier, talked to President Preval, talked to President Aracene and a number of other people about the idea of having an international black arts and cultural festival similar to what happened in, uh, I forget what year it was, in Nigeria, Festac. So we'd already been talking about that. So uh, since Haiti will no doubt build new hotels and new hotels are going up, there's a question as to whether or not he will have enough hotels to accommodate the huge number of people who, wants to, who want to come. And so one morning you just said, well, wait a minute, why don't we make the cruise ship the hotel? So that's the idea. In other words, the idea is that we can take 3,000 people at once on a cruise ship, uh, if more, we can take more, but nonetheless, that was sort of the genesis of the idea. So it will include an international black arts and cultural festival on the ship and on the shore, and we anticipate having artists, poets, writers from all over the world. I mean, in addition to Congressman Conyers and Danny Glover, we expect to see people like Maya Angelou and Jesse Jackson and uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, whose letters you see of support in this uh, envelope, and just many, many others. Uh, Hugh Masekela, Wycliffe, or John, or people we're going to be reaching out to. This is going to be a fabulous experience. And when we get to Haiti, the idea is to have not only performances on the ship, but also to have open air festivals and activities in Haiti, as well as tours to the Citadel to to uh, the oldest church in the, in the hemisphere and various other places. So it's, it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, uh, package. I think there's maybe time for one more. The natives are getting rest of the city. Anyone else from the press? Anyone else from the press? Well, if you have any additional questions, you can reach us. Our numbers are yes. listed uh, through Jeanette and others. We thank you so much for coming and uh, uh, sharing on this occasion. And it's just the beginning. So we're really now ready to, to roll on. So thank you so much. We're going to go real quick with the program and we will continue on board. Pour toutes les amis de famille haïtien, nous comptons pile pour la matière. Et nous disons merci à tous les frères et sœurs qui répondent à l'appel ça aujourd'hui. Parce que en 2004, nous même haïtiens, nous prenons ensemble avec des amis qui croient dans la lutte qui est fait 200 ans, 200 ans de cela et qui prennent retourner dans le pays d'Haïti ensemble avec nous. Maintenant, nous tous avons un programme devant nous. Si nous regardons, nous voyons que moi-même, c'est Caroline Paul, moi c'est exécutive directrice de l'organisation qui est les Haitian American Youth of Tomorrow. C'est les jeunes haïtiens américains de demain. Moi, j'ai un, 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 deux, trois bagages à dire nous, hein, qui est important, parce que quand nous finissons avec le parti programme de l'Europe, nous allons gagner pour nous euh, monter le bateau. Il y a un monde qui perdu le tag. Li. 
Si vous n'avez pas taxe, ça, vous n'êtes pas capable de monter dans le bateau. Someone lost their tag. If you do not have it, you will not be able to board the ship. So if anybody is looking in front of them and do not, do not have a pass, it's in my hand, you need to come and claim it. That's one. Uh, Kounia, without any further ado, I'd like to bring uh, in front Monsieur Jean Mapou that will be speaking with you uh, about 2004. And I'll try to translate and give you guys a summary of what he said. Okay. Uh... Well, I want to welcome you all here. We are under some time constraints, so we're having to be a little creative and modify our program. I want to just now just introduce our special guest, after which we're all going to go on the ship. We know everybody's hungry now for a very delicious meal and a, a delicious occasion, really. And what I would suggest is, because it's going to be very hard, we're all prisoners of uh, our slave masters. So some of us are, you know, encaptured in Spanish, some in English, some in French, and some in... Of course, the Asian people have been ingenious enough to create their own language, so that's beautiful. And maybe we'll all be able to do that at some point. But it would be helpful if there are non-English uh, speakers, if there are English-speaking Haitians who could be with them and sort of help interpret it so we can move along, because otherwise we'll never make it through the program. I'm indeed honored to first introduce Someone who worked very closely with us on this event is all uh, decked out in beautiful, gorgeous African attire today because we are African people. The Council General of uh, Miami here in Miami, D. Victor. <laughs> Next, the person who has the awesome responsibility for representing over 2 million Haitians who live abroad in the diaspora. Uh, someone who I've come to know and meet and consider my friend. Uh, as we've been collaborating together on this uh, event, uh, and that is the Honorable Leslie Voltaire, Minister of Haitian Affairs. And one of the reasons we're late is because sometimes when you have certain star power, then everybody mobs you at the airport and we can't sort of get the bags and get going. But that's great because he's one of ours. Not every person who is an actor or an artist is willing to be with the people. But this person is always willing to be with the people. You'll hear from him later. Please welcome the actor, humanitarian, human rights activist, Danny Lumber. <laughs> one, of people, one of the people who's going to help us recruit the 3,000 plus people we need is a longtime friend of mine. We both come out of the Hill District of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She is the first lady of Night Talk Tape uh, Radio. She can be heard in over 50 cities throughout the country from 10 to 2 every night from Monday through Friday. Would you please welcome Miss Bev, performing at BET on Night Talk And now, and you'll hear him as very shortly after we get on the ship, the person who is by far the leading African American advocate for Haiti. And that's why it's so important that we all work together. An injury to one is an injury to all. And this man works tirely on behalf of Haiti. He is the dean of the Congressional Black Caucus. He's the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee, which means he has some real juice and some real power. But most importantly, he's a dear friend and humanitarian and civil rights and human rights activist, the Honorable John Person, one of the groups that we hope are going to go with us on this trip are Haitian doctors, Caribbean doctors, and African American doctors. And the person who is the chairman emeritus of the board of the National Medical Association, representing thousands of black doctors all the way from Kansas, is Mr. Gilbert Parts. The honorary chairperson of this event hails from New Orleans. He's the former mayor of New Orleans. He couldn't be here today, but he sent his brother. They are both of Haitian descent. So representing the former mayor of New Orleans and the former uh, chairman of the National Conference of City is Jacques Moriel. <laughs> the Oklahoma Healthcare Product Pro Project, and you'll see a lot of him also. He's my longtime friend and key organizer, Wayne Thompson from Oklahoma City. And 
Last but not least, and there are others, by the way, who will be introduced on the ship. We got a list. Like, I know Mayor Celestine is here, but he'll be introduced on the ship. So we got, this is not the whole thing. So we just went our last person, the person who's going to be the executive producer of the International Black Arts and Cultural Festival that's going to bring people from all over the world to be on that cruise ship, is the associate producer of the New Orleans Jazz Festival, the producer of the uh, Essence uh, Jazz Festival, uh, a cultural festival, and the Black Arts Festival in Atlanta, Bobby Murphy. We're going to see a lot of them in New Orleans. We think we have most of your names, and if we miss you now, we'll catch you later. I just mentioned Joseph Celestine, I'll mention it again. Joseph Celestine, would you please uh, uh, stand to be acknowledged. Mayor of North Miami. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to... Miss Jeanette Pinkney, who is our esteemed uh, coordinator, and she whips us, and she's going to whip us on board. No, I'm not going to whip you on board. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, please, if you would, on the way to boarding the ship, sign in at the back there, so be sure we have everyone's information. And as you do that, you will be given a gift that is uh, presented to us by Royal Caribbean. And then I have... Doing it alike. <laughs> I did that alike. Oh. For the picture, we need to do another toast, okay? For our photographer, we do another toast. All right. We do another one. To the Haitian Revolution. To the Haitian Revolution. Run Daniel. Yes. Run Daniel. Run Daniel. <laughs> And to you, Congressman. Chicago. So we're going back to Chicago, and he's, the mayor is very receptive. You're the first. Yes. And uh, oh, you're the one. Yes, I am. <laughs> yeah. I've been here, I've been speaking about you. <laughs> Without and knowing. Just dawned on me. I, I'm delighted to meet you. My pleasure. Sir. I've met Especially you under these circumstances. Oh, absolutely. Sir. It's my pleasure. So Mark stood up in the, in the White House and said, Mr. President, correction, Mr. Celestine may have been the first Asian American <laughs> mayor in the country, but he's not exactly the first because my parents are from Haiti. Well, so, actually, it's some um, nine generations ago. Yes, yes. In my family. Yes. And your father was... Your father was George. My father was mayor from 78 to 86. Great, 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 great. He came from Haiti to New Orleans by way of Santiago de Cuba and Charleston in 1790. Yeah, your dad's alive and well? No, my dad passed in 89. Two years ago. How are you doing? We met several years ago in DC. Uh, probably uh, six years ago. And we went up there at the school. You were in the forefront, so I was here. Yeah. Make it a very big and special sound. Big sound. But I lots of things in it. Lots of things. No problem. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Not on this show. Yeah, I'll, oh, I will take care of it. I'm going to have the sound. Really? Just in my room. Okay. In a very subtle way.
Yeah, she was the... Ah bon Bah j'aime bien ce moment-là. Non, c'est mon Non, mais moi c'est mon Jack Mel, c'est la grande différence. My brother, former mayor Mark Morial, I want to uh, convey to you his regrets. He had uh, a sudden family obligation that prevented him from being here. But I was especially excited to uh, to get this assignment from my brother because. Uh, our family history uh, in Haiti and uh, the role that Haiti's played in the development of our city is something very special to me and something that has always been of, of interest to me. Um, we're excited about this pilgrimage too, not only because our family heritage is uh, firmly rooted in Haiti, but because of the opportunities for renewed inspiration, collaboration, and cooperation not only with the Haitian people, but uh, with African Americans and supporters of Haiti all over. Haiti and New Orleans have enjoyed a, a unique and intimate relationship uh, since the colonial days of both, uh, for over nearly three centuries. During the earliest colonial days, uh, Haiti was a, an important portal, a way station between the colonial powers in France and the capital of the French Empire in North America, New Orleans. These specific traditions and this practice in this place, Congo, Congo Square, actually led directly to the birth of jazz later in the 19th century. Now, Sidney Bechet, one of the three most important pioneers of jazz, was of Haitian descent, and very proudly so, and also a resident of the Treme neighborhood. He celebrated his heritage in a very unique musical style at the time that he engrafted on the very core of the jazz tradition. Uh, later, Bechet uh, was exiled by a hostile racial climate to France. He became a national hero there and was uh, honored with a state funeral when he died in the late 1950s. But uh, back to the essential Haitian influences on New Orleans and the Ameri African American activist tradition that they inspired. The revolutionary ideals of universal human rights and the Haitian assertion of values for people of African descent, help black New Orleanians, regardless of their condition of servitude, forge a greater sense of racial unity and solidarity than found anywhere else in North America. And these values uh, determined assertiveness and courageous resistance, which became a unique but nevertheless essential element of New Orleans culture in general and the culture of the Treme neighborhood in particular. Yes, my neighborhood has a long tradition of, uh, of uh, activism and independence and uh, social activism, to put it quite politely. The first black church parish in North America, uh, the St. Augustine Catholic Church, was established in the Treme neighborhood in 1840, primarily by people of Haitian descent. And this Haitian tradition inspired uh, Homer Plessy, who was a shoemaker and whose great-grandparents uh, were Haitian emigres to challenge the post-Civil War segregation laws, which ultimately resulted in the very famous court decision Plessy versus Ferguson, which, uh, which was responsible for the separate but equal doctrine which prevailed for many decades. This protest tradition and independence tradition survived through the 20th century with social, cultural, commercial, and religious institutions thriving in spite of the separate but equal Jim Crow requirements and traditions. New Orleans was the scene of uh, progressive labor organizations, and I'm proud to say that my grandfather was a cigar maker. He was one of the leaders of a nascent uh, labor union of cigar makers in the early part of this century. Uh, most of the cigar makers in uh, New Orleans were either of Haitian or Cuban descent. And uh, these people organized in the early part of the century uh, a labor union, very much in the tradition of uh, 
Haitian independence and self-determination. Uh, and much later, uh, the Southern Christian leadership was actually founded in New Orleans, consistent with that tradition. So as you can see, I'm very proud of uh, not only my Haitian heritage, but the, uh, the values that it has inspired in all of New Orleans and in my family in particular. I'm very blessed and honored uh, to be here with you. And I uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I look forward to working with all of you to make the pilgrimage to Haiti a big success. Monsieur Badi Murphy, also from New Orleans, is a longtime producer of cultural events. He is a very well traveled producer who has visited Haiti as recently as May of this year. When he leaves Miami this evening, he will be headed to Johannesburg, South Africa, to produce a jazz festival there. And Batty will be the executive producer of the Art and Culture Festival. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, to be a part of this magnificent event that we all are trying to make happen. I am uh, going to be working in producing the Arts and Cultural Festival by land and by sea. We are going to have a very, very exciting program on this uh, on the ship and at sea. Um, we plan to have international entertainment, uh, people that we're going after right now that have indicated that they'd like to be a part of the event are people like uh, Wycliffe John, uh, Hume Sakila, uh, Salif Kita, um, Yusu Endur, and many, many others. Uh, that we're looking at uh, also the Bookman, Bookman Experience will uh, undoubtedly be a part of this event. We will have poets, we will have spoken words, we will have the rhythm and blues. Uh, Monsieur John Mapu will be organizing a, a theatrical uh, performance that will happen on the ship as well. It's going to be very exciting. I'm just really excited about this. Uh, and then as we travel to Haiti, we will um, be disembarking at one or two. all of them with congresswomen and saying these are my people and without any further ado let us give them a big round of applause thank you my brothers and my sisters I assume the podium merely to bring my greetings to you this afternoon on this incredible undertaking. I salute the genius who has developed this Dr. Ron Daniels. Can we not give him a round of applause? As an honorary member of the Screen Actors Guild, I'm glad that my colleague Danny Glover is here. Let us appropriately welcome him to this undertaking. The major difference between me and Danny Glover is that he's an employed actor and I am an unemployed one. And what an actor extraordinaire he is. But more importantly than his artistic gift is his commitment to humanitarian and civil rights here in America, in Haiti, and all over the world. Give him another round of applause. <laughs> to be with Ma Jacques Morial of this great family, the great lineage from Haiti, uh, I am going to take his remarks and insert them into the congressional record when we go into session after Labor Day because everybody in America ought to hear what he said about Haiti and its contribution and Haitians and Haitians America working together.
to make this a more perfect democracy. And may I just uh, additionally welcome the mayor of Lauder Hill, Richard Kaplan, who uh, has friends and relatives in Detroit. Uh, Judy Aust uh, Shirley Austin, whose families uh, in Detroit have been connected with mine on the west side of the city for so long. Mayor Joe Celestin, the uh, election that occurred in this state. Don't you ever forget it. If anybody's talking about get over it, we will never get over it. The fact that 294 votes were shut down by the United States Supreme Court in the most unprecedented political action in the history of this nation. And the one person that cast a deciding vote in the tie 4-4 vote was a fellow named Thomas. <laughs> Clarence Thomas who cast the 5-4 decision. That leads us to now me bringing democracy to Haiti. We need Haiti to bring democracy to us. And so we join not only in the political and economic, but more importantly to me, the cultural. Because music is to me the signal that allows all of us, all of the 6.2 billion human beings on this planet Earth, to communicate to each other, regardless if they can speak Creole, French, English, but the music connects us. And out of Haiti and its African roots have come the creation of the world music celebrated all over this planet, jazz. Very generous, generous, generous remarks, Jeff Smith. I, uh, It's, it's really uh, difficult in some way to kind of express how important this moment is and, and how important it is for me to be here with you today in kicking off this extraordinary undertaking, this extraordinary process, program of cruising in the history. Because we can use that and we can talk about that and simply say that we're going on a cruise ship to Haiti. But the event is much larger than that. Just as the Haitian Revolution and the context of that great revolution and the reverberation of that revolution in the world was much larger than the event itself, this event that we are about to engage on is much larger than that. And we must clearly understand that. And, and as I said to, to Ron Daniels, this brilliant brother who, who was the genius behind it, we gonna work our butts off, means that a whole bunch of us ain't gonna have no booty left. <laughs> because we, we, this is what this is entail, and, and this was what this, will entail every one of us, every single one of us, every single place we can go, whether it's to our campus, to our workplace, whether it's to our sorority, to our fraternity, whether it's to our church, to talk about this, to have discussion. That's what I envision. I'm so proud to be here because that's the dream that I see. That's the idea that I say that, see that every single place in which we can talk about this. It will be important for our own healing. It will be important for us to take the next step. It will be important for the world. I always like to talk about the three revolutions that happened within a 25 year period 
They talk about the American Revolution, they talk about the French Revolution, but they never talk about the Haitian Revolution. And for good reason. Because for good reason, they don't talk about that. Because it took the floor and it elevated the floor. It redefined every single, every single article and every, and, and every single word in those other revolutions, the manifestation of other revolutions, and it took it somewhere else. And that's what it is. And we have to, we have to, at this moment, use that opportunity, this one opportunity, to take it somewhere else. This is not just for the Haitian people. This is for all of us. This is not only for us the, the diaspora, the diaspora. When we talk about from whence, from whence the people who are at the bottom come from, we talk about where we all come from. We talk about how it is important to acknowledge our own history, experience, and culture. No, but no, I can't. I say, I'm, I'm taking all the pictures I can take right now. I got to take pictures with these people right now. All right, brother. Okay. Come on, Ryan. Okay. Ryan. 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 Certainly she knew I was not talking of her, but speaking of her, I was speaking about the uh, racist American European press that dictates how we think about ourselves. When I was speaking at that time and moment, as I will continue to speak, I, I was speaking about the uh, television networks in the country, which we own none, that protects uh, African Americans, people of African descent in a particular kind of way that's psychologically damaging to all people, and particularly our people. We were talking at that time about the 9-11 uh, event when uh, the television station made the decision to continue to show over and over and over and over again those events 
to children all over the country. And I said children did not need to see a thousand buildings being hit by a thousand planes. That that was not helpful to people psychologically. And, and it was just like showing people hangings of African American people in years past. It just wasn't useful to their psychic or anyone. And, and I, I still uh, would continue to like to encourage that point to be understood.